greet, <clears throat> I greet you all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before I move to the main message, I want to remind us all that uh, we are right now in what we call as the season of epiphany. The word epiphany means uh, manifestation, manifestation of God and his glory and his grace. Actually, the season began in January, uh, this past January the 6th, and it extends all the way till, uh, you know, the, the season of Lent, and then, of course, moving on towards uh, the crucifixion and Easter. As I said, the season of uh, Epiphany is a season of manifestation, which focuses on key events in Jesus' earthly life. Uh, it reveals his identity as the incarnate son of God. So Epiphany is a season for seeing more of Christ's glory by focusing on his life and mission. Let me quote from a theologian who talks about the Epiphany in this manner. He says, during the weeks of Epiphany, we focus our gaze on Jesus in order to glimpse his glory, his transfigured beauty and power, his embodied grace and truth. And what we are given to see, we gladly speak to our friends that they might share with us in the light of Christ. So uh, one way Jesus manifests himself is of course through his sheer presence. And those of you who heard the sermon last week uh, given by Praveen, we know we, we talked about how we can experience the presence of Jesus Christ. Another way we experience Christ's manifestation, his epiphany, is by his teachings. And may I say revolutionary teachings. We all know how uh, people were astonished at the way Jesus taught the parables and uh, some of the shocking statements that he makes. And the way he taught, he showed extraordinary authority in the way he taught, uh, you know, his disciples and all of those who listened to him. He revealed God in a different light, a different way that the religious teachers did. And today we are going to examine one of those as we continue to reflect upon the epiphany and how Jesus continued to manifest himself and today through his teachings. And uh, I titled my sermon, The Blessed Poor. And many of us will know, and we I'm sure have read, uh, that this comes from the Sermon on the Mount, right? Many refer the Sermon on the Mount as given in Matthew chapter five, six, and seven as the greatest sermon ever preached. And interestingly enough, the author Matthew in his gospel, he starts with this that we just read in the scriptures. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus here is referring to a type of poverty that makes people blessed. I mean, to equate poverty with blessing is completely revolutionary, isn't it? It is, it is countercultural. Many would say being poor is a curse and to be rich is to be blessed. Poverty is not valued. It is not valued in our culture. But Jesus makes this provocative statement by saying, blessed are the poor. And of course, he's, uh, the author Luke stops at Blessed are the poor. Matthew 
adds, blessed are the poor in spirit. But nevertheless, all of this shocked the people that were listening. Now, interestingly, we are focusing on what Matthew uh, quotes in, uh, you know, uh, quotes Jesus. And, uh, and maybe there is a reason why he starts with uh, this particular statement of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Maybe he thought that this is very foundational for us to then understand the rest of the sermon of Jesus on the Mount. Only when we are poor in spirit, are we able to recognize the heart of God? Are we able to follow and make sense of all that Jesus is going to say in this sermon? Like I said, if you look through all of those uh, statements that Jesus makes, it indeed reveals the real heart of God, the heart of the triune God that we worship. So let's uh, spend some time just understanding this one statement that Jesus makes. Uh, before that, I want to make some clarifying or give you some clarifying thoughts. The question is, is Jesus talking about physical poverty or is he talking of some other kind of po poverty? And when we look at even Luke's statements, perhaps this is being inclusive. Maybe he is referring to physical and a spiritual poverty because Jesus talks about, you know, physical poverty and physical riches. Now, we have to be careful that we don't conclude that Jesus is saying that to be rich is inherently evil. No, that is not what he is saying. But he is definitely saying that being rich can be an impediment in having the right relationship with God. It can become a distraction as we try to relate and worship God. And it can also become an impediment in our relationship with one another. Uh, it can tempt us to think that we are okay just because I am rich, just because I am wealthy. Oh, that must be, it must, it must mean that I'm doing something good. And we may not necessarily have a good relationship with God or do not care for other people and have a relationship with them also. You will recall, you know, uh, Jesus' encounter uh, with the rich young man. He talks about riches. He talks about Lazarus and the rich man. In both instances, if you will notice, Jesus is alluding that being rich ca can cause spiritual blindness. Wealth can become a stumbling block. And it can become a stumbling block in having and pursuing a meaningful relationship with God and our fellow human beings. But nevertheless, that, that I mean, we are not going to focus so much on the physical aspect of poverty or riches, but let's look at what Matthew says. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus mean by Blessed are the poor in spirit. What Jesus is challenging us to see is to look into ourselves with a deeper perspective. He wants us to know what are we in our fallen state, in our sinful state. And he describes it as poor in spirit. In other words, what he's saying is that there is a poverty in all of us. We all experience a sense of poverty. In other words, in our fallen state, we are all spiritually bankrupt, utterly incapable of achieving anything that is intrinsically good, anything that is true good. The apostle Paul recognized this, and he puts it like this <clears throat> in Romans chapter 7. He says, I am unspiritual sold as a slave to sin. 
You see, we need to recognize that God indeed created us with a unique value. But that value is real only when we have our identity in Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, when we read Genesis chapter 3, the rebellion took place. And in that rebellion against God, we corrupted that identity, that image that God had given to us. We lost that identity when we took our eyes off God. And by believing the devil's lies, you know, that we can be like God, that we can know good and evil with our own intellect, we began to move away from God. We began to rebel from God and allowed evil to influence us. And that's why we began to recognize, uh, or rather we, 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 we became capable of a lot of evil. And if you look at the world today, the amount of evil that exists, the kind of people that perpetrate such unimaginable evil, we can talk about names like Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot, Jim Jones, who was a religious leader, all of whom brought great evil and great suffering upon the people, thinking that they were doing right. You see, that is what has happened in the deception of, uh, of the evil one. To think that we are okay, that we can be like God and know for ourselves what is right and wrong. And that that is exactly what Jesus was challenging when he made that statement. Jesus was challenging the prevailing attitude of the day. The wisdom of the day is that I can become great and significant through my own effort. I can perform. My, my performance is what is more important. And then they go on to say, I can save myself. What are they saying? I don't need you, God. I don't need God. But thankfully, God's love, in spite of our rebellion, never stopped. It never stopped uh, in spite of the, our rebellion. Unfortunately, today, and of course in the time of Jesus, this is how many religious elite taught. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious teachers, the Roman leadership, they were all marked by moral superiority and they lauded it over others, treated the less fortunate with harshness, many times exploiting them, abusing them. They thought they were the elect. And even today, there are some religious leaders who think that they are the very elect and treat others in such a bad manner. You see, Jesus, by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, was challenging that attitude. He was challenging to see our spiritual poverty, that indeed we are nothing without God. He wants us to honestly confess that we are sinful, capable of great evil. Uh, we have no good in ourselves without God, without our, our value and identity found in God. Jesus wants us to recognize that we lack the moral compass needed to please God. Jesus wanted us to see that this arrogance that we think that we are okay without God is destructive. It leads to spiritual pride. It leads to self-importance, vanity, narcissism, self-delusion, and self being self-deceived. You know, that is the reason why, if you remember, Jesus said, the despised tax collector had the right attitude in the eyes of God. If you remember that 
story that Jesus relates, where two people goes to the temple to pray, one a tax collector and the other a Pharisee. And you remember how the Pharisee prayed? He thought he was great. He was wonderful by himself. He had all it figured out and he had no need for anybody. And that also made him look down upon his fellow human beings. But the tax collector beating his breast, as Jesus says, the tax collector says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. To be poor in spirit is to recognize that we are lost, we are hopeless, and we are helpless without God. So, what does Jesus want us to do? Well, he wants us to recognize this state of ours. He wants us to recognize, and when we recognize this state of ours, we are blessed. How are we blessed? By knowing that we are spiritually poor, spiritually bankrupt. How does it bless us? Well, there are two ways. The blessings that we are blessed when we recognize our spiritual bankruptcy. Number one is when we recognize we are spiritually bankrupt, we will turn to God. You see, we will recognize we have no existence without God. And as we turn our face toward God, we begin to notice that God has already turned his face towards us. Because like I said, he never stopped loving us. It is we who have turned away from him. But God continued to pursue us. And he wants us to recognize our spiritual poverty so that we might turn towards him. And when we recognize that, and when we turn towards him, we will cast ourselves on God's grace, acknowledge our desperate need for God. Jesus is telling us that we are blessed uh, when we recognize that we are spiritually destitute without Jesus. You see, he, we will be blessed when we value our relationship with God more than anything else in this world, more than all that we can accomplish in this world by ourselves. You see, when we know that we are spiritually wanting and when we turn towards God, we will not boast in our accomplishments. We will not boast in our education or in the wealth that we might have. We might not boast in our sto the social status we might enjoy in society. We might not even boast in our religious knowledge, our biblical knowledge. We will not boast in all of these because they are nothing more like what Paul said. And he uses a very interesting word when he says, that I will not boast because I consider all these physical accomplishments skubala. And that is <laughs> and that is a very powerful word that he uses, skubala in the Greek. Let me read to you what he says in the book of Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Here the apostle Paul says, but... Ravi, could you help me with the sharing screen? I got disconnected, so. Can you hear me? Yes, Akka, can we hear? Can we, we can hear you. You better ask Selena because uh, mine is recording actually. Okay, okay, bye. Selena, can you do it? Ravi. By, because you logged out, he logged in here, their recording stopped. That could be a problem then. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll uh, edit it from YouTube. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to confirm. Again, you have to do that now. So that's why I wanted to know if it's, if it's okay or not. I'll manage. I have other uh, back sources. Okay. Yeah, then good. No problem. I just came back to let you know that. 
is in Christ. Paul recognized that his value, his worth, his significance is Jesus Christ, not in himself. And that is what is being poor in spirit, to recognize we are nothing without Christ. And we are blessed when we know that. We are blessed when we realize that we need to be saved and we cannot save ourselves. That our riches and our wealth and all our accomplishments and all our works cannot redeem us from sin. So we turn toward God and that is how we are blessed. A second way we are blessed is what Jesus said. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the kingdom of heaven is symbolic of the greatest treasures of life. The kingdom of heaven is the repository of every true riches in the world. And that is what Paul, Paul recognized. Once again, if I can use his words, he says, I consider them dung that I may gain Christ. And Christ is the very embodiment of the kingdom of heaven. You see, that's how he came. Even at the very beginning, he said, I have come to announce the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And he says, repent, believe, believe that I have come to give you the kingdom. I have come to help you recognize entrance into the kingdom of heaven. We are truly blessed when we have access to the greatest treasure, and that is Christ himself, who is the very embodiment, like I said, of the kingdom of God, where we experience God's love, his acceptance, his embrace, his welcome to eternal life to life eternal of joy, of peace, of happiness. I remember reading a story of a man called David Eng. Uh, David Eng is a Singaporean. And he was a very, very rich man. And he is a rich man. He lives in Singapore. Uh, it says as uh, reported in the Forbes magazine, that Philip and uh, Robert and David were worth $12.1 billion <laughs> because he owns, you know, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, successful organizations, uh, being a very, you know, successful a landlord, property developer. And he had no, uh, you know, dearth of wealth. But this is what he says. As I read to you from the Forbes magazine, David Eng says, I was always in search for a better life, a better purpose, a better me, a better everything. I was just looking at all the wrong things. Whatever I've discovered, what I've discovered, he says, is that we are all broken. We are all broken. He recognized his spiritual poverty, in other words. And he goes on to say, we all have a missing piece. And for me, I discovered that missing peace was God through Jesus Christ. You see, when he found Christ, he found the kingdom of God. And when he found the kingdom of God, he felt blessed. He realized that his $12.1 billion kingdom was not what truly gave him his eternal worth. His eternal worth he recognized was in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So brethren, uh, 
Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are we willing to recognize our spiritual poverty? Are we willing to recognize that life is meaningless, purposeless without God? Are we willing to recognize that we cannot achieve true blessedness on our own, in our own accomplishments? As much as many of those accomplishments are okay and good and necessary and needed, but are we willing to recognize that there is a poverty that we all have and that poverty cannot be fulfilled in the physical physicalities of this world? Are we willing to realize that true riches is much more than money, is much more than what we have in our bank account, is much more than the palatial building that we might own or the degrees that we have earned, the social status we might possess in our community. Are we willing to recognize that to be truly blessed is what Paul said to gain Christ? You know, I was uh, remembering that song that we normally sing and uh, I, re I realized that song seemed to indicate that poverty in spirit that we indeed experience. Uh, it, the, the song is titled, Lord, I Come. And I wanted to just read you some of the lyrics. It goes like this, Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Oh, God, I need you. That is what is being poor in spirit. And brethren, as I lead you in the communion at this moment, let us Let's bring our elements together and as, as we partake in the communion today, let us not be ashamed to declare our spiritual poverty, that indeed we are nothing without God. We all come with empty hands. Because there is nothing that we can give to God. Let us acknowledge that indeed we have empty hands, which we can stretch out towards God Almighty. In Christ our Lord, we can be blessed. Because Christ Jesus said to us, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Join me as I pray and bless the elements as we partake of it. Gracious, loving God, as we come before the table to partake in the communion, Lord, we want to recognize our spiritual poverty. Many times we don't recognize it, Lord, and we perhaps don't realize it enough. Sometimes, many times, we think we are okay. We are all right. But we are not. We need you. Every hour, we need you. Every moment, we need you, Lord. It is you who gives us the very purpose and meaning of life. It is you in Christ that gives us our very identity. It is only in you we can experience true riches, which you call as the kingdom of heaven. Today, Lord, we come with empty hands and we stretch them out towards you to praise you, to worship you, and to receive from you blessings that only you can give us. And we do this in this ritual, which we call the Lord's Supper or the communion. 
and we take this bread, which is symbolic of the body that you have so willingly given to us, broken so that our brokenness can be healed. We ask your blessings upon the wine, which is symbolic of the blood that you shed for us, so that, Lord, we may not have to die eternally, but receive redemption and spiritual healing for all eternity. And so we thank you, Lord, as we declare indeed our spiritual poverty towards you. Thank you for blessing us and helping us see that indeed blessed are those who are poor in spirit. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us take the bread and partake of it as the body of Jesus Christ. Let us take the wine, <clears throat> symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, for our healing and for our redemption, the blood, the blood of Christ. In this season of epiphany, may you and I recognize that in Christ, you and I are most blessed.